Mike Rowe is a best-selling author, Emmy winner, and podcaster best known for his stint hosting the Discovery Channel's long-running Dirty Jobs, where he performed the sort of work we all rely on but don't want to think about too much. From cleaning septic tanks to putting hot tar on roofs to disposing of medical waste, he's done it all and loves to talk about the value of the hard, honest work that he thinks is devalued by a society fixated on sending everyone to college. I caught up with Roe at Freedom Fest, an annual gathering held this year in Memphis. We talked about how his Micro Works Foundation matches young people interested in learning trades with employers dying for applicants, why men continue to fall farther behind women in school and work, and how Noble Whiskey, named after Mike's maternal grandfather, is fueling his nonprofit's impact. Mike Rowe, thanks for talking to Reza. It's been a hot minute, man. It has been. It's been, uh, what was it, 2016 or 2017? 14 was the first one. Yeah. Which I thought went very well. Yes. 16, again, yeah. which, modesty aside, I thought yeah. was even better. Okay. So, so my expectation, I don't even know what to think about what's about yeah, to Yeah, this, I'm thinking, you know, Spider-Man 3, mm. the third Matrix movie, this is a disaster written all over it. But you don't know, right? You don't know where the line is until you go over it. Yeah, so I right. think in the spirit of self-reflection, we ought to just check each other as we go. And okay. Do me this favor, if you would. Yes. Because I can't remember. If you if I start to tell a story that yeah. I've already told you, just say, dude. But this is like the third time you've said this already. It, so just, yes. Is that all you have? No. Okay. Uh, very good. So, well, what is your mission these days? Or, or I guess a better way of phrasing it, and I should have just started with this, you know, you kind of emerged as a person talking about policy um, on the backs of noting the tremendous mismatch between the way we're educating our kids and the economy that's out there, mm -hmm. and also what you know what different kids want. Um, and you talked about how uh, you've talked about how we've made work the enemy, about how vocational and technical schooling at the high school level has all but disappeared in a mad rush to push people into a college track, which, yep. however well-intentioned, I think we both obviously benefited from going to college, so it's not either or, but it's left a lot of kids stuck in school that they don't like, and it's left a lot of employers just kind of like, where where is my work? Where yeah. are my workers? Um, give us an update on how things are going in terms of the Micro Works Foundation matching, you know, people who might be interested in trade jobs and employers who desperately need them. Well, I'm older than I've ever been, yeah. right? And so that's really the thing. Um, <laughs> I, I said some things to you 10 years ago, and I said some things on Labor Day of 2008 when we started MicroWorks <laughs> um, that have turned out to be kind of prophetic, if I don't yeah. say so myself. And um, while I'm not going to take a victory lap on any of it, because some of the news is bad, by and large, the operating thesis has been borne out. Mm -hmm. We gave college a giant PR campaign that it really did need mm -hmm. starting back in the 70s. Right. But all that great press came at the expense of virtually every other form of education. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we created a giant gap in the workforce between blue and white collar jobs. White were clearly ascendant. Blue was clearly subordinate. And the rift in our workforce and the labor shortage that we're seeing today, in my estimation, can be walked right back to the moment we decided to take shop class out of high school. And so many things followed that as a result. One of those things in a completely tertiary way was a show called Dirty Jobs, yep. which basically gave me permission to crawl through sewers and channel my inner eight-year-old. Finally. Yeah. Right. Good. I mean, it, it was such an odd thing, Nick, for that show to happen yeah. the way it happened. But to your very kind preface to the question you posed, I didn't really start looking for a way to articulate a policy mm -hmm. because I had some deeply held belief and I needed to I needed to be heard. That crazy show blew up mm -hmm. and then the headlines caught up to the themes of the show. So in 2008, Dirty Jobs have been on for right. five years. Suddenly, it's this hit. The country goes into a recession. Work finds its way mm -hmm. into the headlines, along with the skills gap. 
And people started to call me mm-hmm. to see if I had an opinion. And um, I, I kind of did, but honestly, it wasn't so much of mine as what was left over from buying lots of beer for lots of people who we featured on the show mm-hmm. and listening to them uh, bitch, complain, moan, uh, and just wax on about the challenges of running a small business that required skilled labor. Mm-hmm. So after hearing a lot of that, MicroWork started. And uh, today, 15 years later, I really haven't changed a thing. Mm-hmm. We're still saying, look, the opportunities that exist are real. They're underserved. They're underpromoted. And the skills gap has widened. Mm. Last time we talked, there were 2.3 million open positions. Um, sorry, there were and, probably close to four or five in 2016. And these are like trade jobs, right? Well, or broadly speaking. Or- I don't want to paint with too broad a brush, but of the 11 million open jobs today, the vast majority don't require a four-year degree. Mm-hmm. They require training. Right. So does that make them trade jobs? Not necessarily, but a mm-hmm. big chunk of them are. Um, on the consumer side, I think the real thing that's changed, that's alarming, and also was pretty easy to predict, was how long do you want to wait for a plumber? Mm-hmm. Right. So the conversation used to be, let me talk about the myths and misperceptions that keep people out of plumbing, so people who might mm-hmm. want to jump into that trade will benefit. Mm-hmm. And then it was, well, let's talk about some of the stigmas and the stereotypes that keep parents and guidance counselors from Mm -hmm. promoting these trades because now we're just getting in our own way. Today, it's just, how long do you want to wait for a plumber or Mm -hmm. an electrician? Today, and this is what I had sort of hoped would happen because I think it's the final step in writing the ship, we have to have people who don't work in the trades or who don't employ trades people to realize that they nevertheless have skin in the game. Right. And they have to be a part of the conversation. And that is like, I don't want to wait six months for a plumber. That's right. That's when it gets personal. Has the plumbing industry and and maybe other trades, you know, carpentry or, or, you know, just construction, things like that, have they changed the way that they go after workers? Mm -hmm. And do have they made it easier to enter those trades? Because depending on where you live, if you live, uh, you know, as I have at, at various points, in the Midwest and small towns, mm-hmm. you know, getting into something is very different than I live in New York City now. And, you know, if there's something harder than getting into Columbia or NYU, it might be getting into the plumbers union. Right. So, I mean, right. have have the trades changed the way that they attract and kind of train people? That's a really interesting point. I hadn't thought about elitism in the trades in the yeah. way that you know, the difficulty of getting into a certain union mm. might help set that table. Um, I do think broadly things have changed. Uh, your, your first point was yeah. from a recruiting proposition, are companies becoming more persuasive mm-hmm. in making a case for themselves? Yeah. And I think they have. But again, that's pretty broad. Some have, for sure. Some haven't. We uh, can learn a lot, I think, about the recruiting messages that we see in the armed forces. They're different. Mm -hmm. The Army has a different proposition than the Navy. They're close. The Navy wants you to go on an adventure. The Army wants you to be all you can be, and you'll leave uh, better for it as a result. Mm -hmm. The Coast Guard, I'm not quite sure what they're saying, but it's also a variation on that theme. I suspect the Coast Guard always has a lot of people going there because that's the safest branch. It feels like it. Now, the Seabees different yeah. deal. They're right. trades, right? So yeah. it, all of these are interesting, right till you get to the Marines mm-hmm. who say, eh, probably not for you. Yeah. Right. Right? right. And so there is something fundamentally interesting about, historically anyway, mm-hmm. the challenge of recruiting uh, into the Marines versus everybody right. else. I, it might be a bit of a stretch, but I think I think employers have made a mistake over the years by by apologizing for their for the opportunities, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. by saying, "Look, it's better than you think," right. or "It's not as bad as you've been told," mm-hmm. and and so everything just feels subordinate going in, when in fact, right now, and this has changed a lot too. We've we've assisted nearly two thousand people through mm-hmm. MicroWorks 
Um, we've awarded close to $7 million in work ethic scholarships. And for me, Nick, the, the big change now is it's not just me, hmm. older than I've ever been, anecdotally telling you about what I think might be a good hmm. idea for your kids. We can now bring back people who we have assisted three, four years ago hmm. and sit down just like this, and I can talk to them, hmm. and they tell their story. And when a millennial or a Gen Zer Here's a 25-year-old, 26-year-old woman talk mm -hmm. about making $160,000 a year welding, Yeah, right? They sit up. Mm -hmm. They're just more persuasive than I am. The optics right. are better. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and so, they have more skills than you, to be quite I honest. I mean, you right? can't. Yeah. <laughs> Brutal. My toolbox is a yeah. <laughs> limited and not a, a traditional blue-collar one. But right. yes, they do. They're, they're highly skilled mm -hmm. and as important they possess the kind of work ethic that I think every parent hopes their kids inherit, and certainly every employer hopes their employees possess. Let's talk a little bit about work ethic. And I'm, I'm you know, like you, I, I'm an old, old person who is getting older every day. Um, and, you know, I don't want to just be the old man who is like, you know, finally, I can remember, you know, my little league coaches, my Boy Scout troop leaders, and so, you know, who would just get apoplectic. You know, and it was like, you're just an old man, like you're going through male menopause or something yeah. like that. I don't want to be that person. But when you look at qu questions, maybe not of work ethic, because that, you start to get into value judgments, but labor force participation mm -hmm. rate. One of the things that is amazing is that if you, the, the idea of an after school job, you know, if you're in high school now, if you're 16 years old, you basically don't work. Mm -hmm. Um you know, what What went into that? Why did those jobs disappear? And what are the effects of coming out of high school and increasingly, you know, people coming out of college without ever having done even, you know, a kind of make work job for a, right. couple, for a couple hours a week? I think, boy, that's a big one. Part of the answer has to do, I believe, with the idea that we think the lower rungs on the ladder mm -hmm. are somehow less important. Part of it has to do with the conversation we've heard around like the minimum wage, mm -hmm. right? And so many arguments that attempt to take an entry level job that was never designed to generate enough income yeah. to support you and, and, and belittle that opportunity mm -hmm. because it's not <laughs> yeah. a higher rung, right? right? And so we we just entered into this space, I think, where we wanted all of the rungs on the ladder to be absolutely equal. Mm -hmm. And because they're not, we we began to look for scapegoats, mm -hmm. right? And we, we we began to look for explanations as to as to how these lower rungs were uh, somehow marginalized, yeah. right? It's just all it's goofy. Yeah, there's a chronology to uh, to climbing a ladder. There's a chronology to living your life, you know. And we're supposed to be smarter as we get older. I right. hope I hope we are. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't know. I to me, the conversations I've had with a lot of people coming right out of college is they don't want to waste their time on the lower rungs. Yeah, there's an impatience with it, uh, and and that's really a shame because you know the things you can learn on the lower rungs. The things sure. you're supposed to learn yeah. are just, are, are manifold. I am wondering how much, and uh, you know, in the uh, interim since we last talked, I uh, co-authored a story at Reason about millennials, which, uh, and this would have been around, uh, you know, 2015, 2016, something like that. So around the time we uh, talked, and it was very positive because Millennials were doing pretty well, and they seemed hopeful. Um, you know, it, things change, uh, mm -hmm. but um, you know, I remember writing about how they were going to be the first generation in America to really deliver on the American dream. Where I thought about my grandparents, who were immigrants from Ireland and Italy, came here. They left horrible circumstances, came to bad circumstances, but mm -hmm. they got to choose them at least. My parents and my aunts and uncles were raised in, you know, immigrant ghettos and then went through the Depression and World War II. Um, and it, it was much better 
Um, but they worked during the week to have a little bit of money on the weekend to have fun. Mm -hmm. Their jobs were not fulfilling. They did not expect them to be fulfilling. My uh, uh, siblings and my kind of cousin cohort, we more or less got, we had many more options in our jobs. Some of, for some of us are very expressive of who we are and what we want to do. But my kids' generation, you know, and this is, I have one millennial and one Gen Z, this is the delivery on the on the promise that their jobs are going to really express who they are and what they care about fundamentally. Right. And, you know, in the time since that article came out, and I talked to a lot of millennials and Gen Z people who tend to be very sour and bitter, uh, and they feel like they've been lied to and cheated even before COVID, after that, you know, imagine going to college or trying to go to work during COVID. It sucks, you know, and, yeah. and like, you know, you're not going to die from this disease but somehow you have to stay at home, et cetera. And I realized part of it was, I was saying like, could you imagine being told when you're 21, go out and find a job that expresses who you are and your deepest commitments, right. whether they're political or social or ideological. How and the hell did like, that happen? How, yeah. did, how did work become the primary metric, yeah. the mirror that we hold up? It's a it's a big important part of our lives for sure. Yeah, but you're so right. The the well, pressure. I know. I I push that into circulation. Like I believe that. Yeah. Um, and I realize now it's kind of a you know it was a big miscalculation to expect young people to know what they wanted to do and then also be able to do it because well I it, you know when I look back <laughs> at my my you know, entire uh, career is a mix of dirty jobs, like of the sort that you would do. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the kind of intellectual equivalent of that, of writing for teen magazines and business magazines and things that you would never in a thousand years want to read yourself. Right. But that's what you do in order to build the skills so that you know what you want and you might be able to get a job doing that. Sometimes. You know, you make yeah. little rocks out of big rocks. Right. Sometimes your day might have felt like drudgery. You've yeah. probably written some articles that you actually didn't give a damn about, but yeah. you made your deadline and right. you got it done. Right. And you were able to take some satisfaction from doing that. You know, the 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 irony is with with Gen Z, and again, way too broad a brush. Mm -hmm. But I've hired a few, and around my foundation, you know, uh, they come in knowing that. Okay, well, MicroWorks is trying to close the skills gap, yeah. right? MicroWorks believes that, you know, all jobs are opportunities and that mm -hmm. some jobs have gotten short shrift and they get all that. Yeah. And um, six months later, you know, they'll come into the office and they'll say, so look, um, I've been reading some articles and uh, the skills gap's not closed yet. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I've been here six months, okay? <laughs> what What's the holdup? Right. And so... It's, it's easy to poke fun at that, yeah. but I, I try not to because it just, who gave them that expectation? Mm -hmm. If these are snowflakes, where are the clouds from yeah. which they fell? That, that right. would be us. Yeah, totally, right? totally. And so, you know, I want to give the benefit of the doubt to everybody I meet in terms of their own work ethic. Yeah. I don't want to think of people as being fundamentally lazy. The problem is they are. When I say they, I mean me. Yeah. No, I, we, this is the fault in yeah. our stars. We're not born eager to get up early, stay right. late, volunteer for the crappy yeah. jobs. We're rivers trying to get to the ocean. We mm -hmm. get to a mountain. We don't go over it. We just go around it. Yeah. Just keep going. So, you know, there's a lot of new research since we spoke last that, that goes to work ethic and mm -hmm. goes right to your point. Nick Eberstadt wrote a great book back in 2016 called Men Without Work, uh -huh. and he republished it after the lockdowns right. because it just became hyper real yeah. and, and super relevant. According to him, 7.2 million able-bodied men in prime working age mm -hmm. are sitting out the workforce. You know, not, not just not working, but affirmatively yeah. not looking for work, yeah. right? That's new. That's right. never happened in peacetime, you yeah. know? And uh, what do you what do you think goes into that? Um, like why? I mean, part of me wants this. You know, I, I agree it's problematic. And, you know, in prepping for this, I was looking at Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, labor force participation rates. And this is men and women. So it's a whole workforce. 
basically the only place where there are more people of a given age working than in 20, in 2001, in 2021, are if you're 55 and older. Yeah. All of the younger categories, there's a smaller percentage of, you know, 25 to 34 year olds working now than in 2001. And it's kind of like, what, you know, what, where is that? You know, part of me wants to say, well, that's an artifact of wealth. Uh, like you were saying, you know, like if you don't have to work for a living, why would you? So we're, we're carrying more people. Right. Um, but, you know, then it's kind of interesting that people over 55 are hustling more. It's an artifact of comfort, for sure. Yeah. I don't know if it's an artifact of wealth. I, I do think that if, if we succeed in making work the enemy, right. as a society, if, if we succeed in identifying the proximate cause of our misery <laughs> as this antiquated routine of getting up and driving in yeah. and, and so forth and so on, well, then, then yeah, we're going we're gonna to look for any dodge we can find in order not to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't have to be wealthy not to work. You just have to be able not to work in right. order not to work. Yeah, yeah. So wherever the standard is, it's being met by lots and lots and lots and lots of yeah, people. And so part of that might be, you know, that families have a little bit more money, so they're letting kids, you know, stick around longer uh, without paying rent or, you know, leaving the nest. Mm. Some of it is surely, uh, you know, transfer payments. Um, you know, I know George W. Bush was assailed as a conservative, but he was a compassionate conservative. And when he took office, in, you know, right around the time of the tech bubble bursting, he expanded a variety of welfare benefits that right. he never really closed. Hmm. So when the economy took off, so people, you know, were able to get food stamps, were able to get different. And I'm not, you know, we can argue about whether or not these are good things in general, but we, as a society, you know, both kind of in a family level and at a governmental level, we support more people not working. Than we used to. Right. He also said so. You're you're talking about senior Bush. Uh, senior? No, W was the w. compassionate conservative. That, that's right. Now yeah. his dad, I believe, was the guy who talked about a thousand points of light. That's right. Okay. Yes. One of which we should point out, especially to younger people, was throwing up on a Japanese politician, in, <laughs> which is kind of great. Didn't I think we should. I wish politics had more of that. He threw up on a Japanese politician. Yeah. Now, but didn't his son get a shoe thrown at yes, him by an angry right. Japanese reporter? Well, I think it was an Iraqi, uh, an Iraqi or a Middle Eastern. Are we person. really going to conflate Japan and Iraq I'm on not, this I'm podcast? Not. Yeah, I don't think I am. I don't think I'm going yeah. to. Okay. Somebody so, may have. Yes. Um, point being, if we're in a society where a thousand points of light yeah. are real, that is to say, a th you know, many, many, many charitable endeavors right. run by passionate people who yep. care deeply about approving life in their zip code, right? Yep. If that's the world that we're in, then we might be able to look at Eberstadt's mm -hmm. uh, numbers and go, okay, what are these 7.2 million able-bodied yep. men doing if they're not affirmatively looking for work? Right. Might they, he said hopefully, be engaged with one of these points of light? Mm -hmm. Might they be doing something to contribute to society yeah. and ultimately to themselves as a result right. of this? And unfortunately, <laughs> the data says, no, they're not yeah. doing that yeah. at all. What they're doing is spending over 2,000 hours a year on their screens. Right. They're swiping left, they're swiping right. Mm -hmm. They're TikToking, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're just doing that thing. And look, that might be a little too disparaging. Maybe what they're doing on their screens is taking deep dives into thoughtful yeah. conversations like this one right. uh, or taking free courses from MIT. Yeah. I don't know. But whatever it is, it's new. Whatever they're doing, right. it's not public service. It's not work as we understand yeah. it. They're, they're outside of the so They're mechanism. not even drug dealing. Forgot. They're not even drug you know, dealing. It's, I mean, it's, it's this just, is not. Yeah, it's the new level of laziness. Um, you know, to uh, drill down on this a little bit though, too. Like you, you started talking about men, and you know, Nick Eberstadt's book, along with uh, Richard Reeves, mm. has a book out um, uh, of called "Of Boys and Men," which also looks at it. Let's focus a little bit on the gender component of this. Are women dropping out of the workforce in the same way? I don't know, Nick. What is yeah. a woman? 
Yeah, that's true. That's a good question. <laughs> really, we're going to do this? Yeah. Um, well, I can tell you anecdotally, my foundation, the, the amount of people who apply for work ethic scholarships, mm. there are more men than women. Okay. But there are a shockingly high number of women. And these are for jobs that traditionally were just considered more male. Correct. Right. In fact... Like welding is a, is a good Welding's example. Welding yeah. is a terrific example. Um, we just, we've just we been trying to, to, to do a better job of telling the stories mm -hmm. of the people that I've just mentioned. And we just shot with five of them, created five PSAs, which modesty aside are <laughs> terrific. Um, and my favorite one is with a woman named Chloe Hudson, who uh, applied for a work ethic scholarship six years ago. We gave her a little bit of money. She was this close to borrowing a few hundred grand to be the plastic surgeon that she had always dreamed of becoming, mm -hmm. but froze up at the last second as an awful lot of money, yeah. and she just didn't want to do it. Flash forward, she is a rock star. Right, she's just killing it. She, everybody loves her. She's so good at what she does. What she do? She right now she's working over at uh, Joe Gibbs, uh, mm -hmm. right? So she's working on race cars. Wow. You know, she had worked in various other fields prior to that, but always welding. It just made sense mm -hmm. to her, which is so interesting. Yeah. If you if you juxtapose a plastic surgeon with a welder, yeah, it's a different kind of surgery, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know, but there's a lot of similarity. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you where it, it gets dissimilar. There's zero debt. Yeah. There's 160 grand a year. Wow. And there is the abject admiration of lots of men who mm. look at her and see the talent yeah. that, that she has. She said, just like we're talking right now, and she said, I'm not I'm not the best female welder. I'm not a weld her. <laughs> she doesn't care about the gender. Yeah. She aggressively doesn't care about it. She cares about the talent. Yeah. Right. So, you know. I'm tempted to say some some things broadly about what's going on with mm -hmm. with gender in the workforce, but I think the book you referenced is 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 on point. I think we're failing our boys mm -hmm. badly. I think about it too in terms of when you were talking about you know we we try to avoid work if possible. I remember a moment I would hear this from you know my relatives and friends of mine who you know who had parents and grandparents the same age, and you would always hear the same story. And it finally clicked to me, which was that, you know, the depression hit, 1929 came, mm. and grandpa could never find work again. But grandma somehow was like cooking for people, cleaning, running a, room, a rooming house, you know, doing all things. And like, finally, about the 30th time I heard that, I was like, how is it that like women during the depression started working like 20 jobs, whereas the men, including my father's father, just kind of disappeared and would show up every once in a while when he sniffed, you know, welfare money or a paycheck. And I was like, this, there's something different about men, mm -hmm. I think, um, that is disturbing. I mean, they, we're all, you know, we have the Jughead Jones trait where we will, you know, yeah. put in as much time to avoid work as just getting it done and then getting on with the rest of the So day. what about this? What if, what if women, in a general way, are more like a general practitioner? Mm -hmm. And what if men in a general way, are more like a specialist. Maybe men gravitate toward the kind of skill that feels like a speciality, mm -hmm. right? And maybe women, historically anyway, because they have to do so many different things, just approach work from a different angle. Mm -hmm. Look, I think, I, think the, I think the modern day farmer and the old day farmer, for that matter, are, are probably the best example of what I'm talking about. It's not a gender thing. It's just this idea that if you're going to be a successful farmer, you better understand the environment. Mm -hmm. You better understand ecology. You better understand food science. Mm -hmm. You better understand plumbing. You better understand mm -hmm. veterinary science. You have to do a and lot finally, of different things. You also have to be able to transact, like when you're selling your crops or your. your you livestock. better understand business. Yeah. You better understand yeah. supply and demand. You better, mm -hmm. you know, farmers are plagued by something really that almost nobody else is, and that's they overproduce. Mm -hmm. They're so good at what they do, they're so efficient, right? right? One and a half percent of the country is mm -hmm. feeding 330 million people three times a day, and mm -hmm. the rest of the world. Yeah. And so, you know, they have to look at work differently in in my view and just a quick sidebar too before i forget i i think it's so interesting i 
I learned years ago, a miner told me this. He said, with respect to work, there are many, 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 many jobs, but there are only two industries, farming and mining. <laughs> every single thing in this room, in this hotel, here at Freedom Fest, every, every single thing is either grown from the ground and turned into something useful that we can eat or, you know, sit in, mm -hmm. uh, or it's pulled from the ground and fashioned by a tradesman and, mm -hmm. and into something useful. So those are the only two industries that, that matter. Everything else becomes a, a, a more specialized thing, mm -hmm. you know? So maybe there's something in this idea of industries uh, versus jobs mm. or careers versus vocations mm. and, and just the way we think about work when we're young, to your earlier point. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did you think about it in terms of, like you, when you were describing your childhood and your dad's yeah. childhood, there was adversity in it. Mm -hmm. There were challenges and things. Do you feel like those tempered you in a way that actually made your parents' job maybe a little easier than it would be today for yeah. a wealthy set of parents, you know? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think, you know, part of it is if you think about something like Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, needs. Yeah. you know, it used to be, and, you know, he never used a pyramid, but we're in Memphis named after a city with pyramids. There's a big <laughs> pyramid right around the corner from here. <clears throat> so I'm going to invoke a pyramid, but we, you know, all of humanity has moved so far up the pyramid that we're, we're all like pharaohs now. Nobody is, you know, nobody's actually schlepping rock anymore. Right. And as a result, you, you know, you, you become pickier and choosier and things like that. But to go to your point, um, you know, when I, I went to college because I didn't want to live with my parents and I could afford it and I, I paid for it myself. And then when I graduated college, I would work so I could get money to travel in a 1970 Plymouth Valiant that broke down because I stupidly thought that I could actually do tune-ups. By the it. way, what a, I mean, the Valiant, are you it, kidding me? Was, Who doesn't buy a car called the Valiant? Yeah, I, well, it was indestructible, I found, because I had screwed up the timing belt. I had ruined virtually every aspect of it, but it would still keep going. But I would work for three months or six months. And then over a number of years, I was like, okay, well, what am I good at? And, you know, what you know, what do I like doing? And I kind of crept into journalism. Uh, I worked in uh, Johnson & Johnson personal product factories. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of horrible jobs. But then it started, you know, what what I was good at and what I wanted to do and what the world would pay me for all started to come into more focus. Well, let's go back um, to your car, man. Because look, I... Valiant. The coward dies a thousand deaths. Yeah. The Valiant, but one. I mean... <laughs> Never mind the fact that cars used to be named amazingly cool things. Now we have, yeah. what, the probe or whatever it is. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with probing. But, yeah, you probe know. Probe saved my life. Yeah. <laughs> there, there is something valiant yeah. and something noble about everything you've just described. It's, all, it's, it's rooted in, in, in practicality. And it's, a, you know, it's, it's the part of the iceberg that you don't see, which incidentally brings me back to the pyramid, yeah. right? A lot of people, like if you look at those three pyramids in Egypt, mm. have you ever seen the, the imagined uh, graphic that shows you the subterranean look of what's beneath the pyramids? I, I'm afraid to look, but well, tell me. It's, picture the Washington Monument. Mm -hmm. Like what if the pyramids oh, wow. are just the top of the yeah. Washington Monument? Yeah, what if yeah, yeah. under them, are hundreds or thousands of feet of yeah. this, this this giant rectangle. Right. A pyramid is just the top right. of a thing. But we tend to look at pyramids as this... The ice, apex of something, literally. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. But we don't imagine what might be under it. Right. Right. So, Do you think then uh, that we, you know, kind of as a society, we've, we've lost, you know, the process of what goes on underneath oh, and hell, adds yeah. to all of this, including... Work. I mean, because you know, when I think about it, it's also, um, you know, the 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 work that you do, or not maybe not the work, the activity you do, maybe in your twenties. And I think this is true on some level of every socioeconomic level. But yeah. you wander around because you don't know who you are, and you you're don't not know supposed what to you know want. who you are. And you're supposed to go out and you know have a lot of adventures and a lot of experiences, and hopefully 
that which doesn't kill you makes you a little bit smarter, maybe mm-hmm. not stronger, and and you kind of figure out what you know what path you want to actually take. How many times do you have to touch the hot stove yeah. before you realize that's not a thing I want to touch? Well, I'm the, thinking more uh, actually about the old uh, orange juice concentrate cans <laughs> in the freezer. Uh-huh. And I would touch my tongue to that every time because I was like, this time it's not going to stick. Wow. Well, but, you know what? I mean, And here we are. Maslow would have said yeah. something very different uh, yeah, about yeah, you. That's true. That's right? true. Yeah. Um, but yes, that's, that's it on steroids. We... Our peripheral vision seems to have vanished. We can only see the stuff that's right in front of us, right? We, we can't see a pyramid as anything other than a three-dimensional triangle that right. sits on the ground. Um, that's what dirty jobs... The, my, this is my whole career yeah. now that I think about it. I mean, celebrating the work that's out of sight and therefore mm-hmm. out of mind right. was just simply a thing that wasn't done on TV. Mm-hmm. And then we started to do it. And then a conversation unfolded that said, wait a minute, there is an awful lot of things going on that we can't see that matter a lot. Right. And so for me, I think everything we're talking about right now is a mix of two really interesting things. It's the stuff you can't see that is nevertheless salient. And then it's the stuff that is impossible to not see, the marketing, Mm -hmm. the PR, the name of the car, the Valiant, right? All of that that thought that goes into branding work, all that thought that goes into promoting opportunity, mm-hmm. that's PR in its purest form. So when you have something that that's that overt, trying to make a persuasive case for the part of the pyramid you mm-hmm. can't see, you got a, a pretty interesting challenge, right. you know, and it's a, it's a pretty interesting balance. But if you only look at at the surfacey mm-hmm. promo-y thing, then I think you wind up kind of where we are now mm-hmm. with millions of jobs that have great opportunities attached to them that people are highly skeptical of, right? right? So, you know, a more balanced conversation might lead to a more balanced workforce. So do you... I mean, have you talked to education associations or school? I mean, is there is there a move towards, you know, more vocational training? And that's even, you know, that's the wrong term for this. Um, you know, fewer people are going to college. Uh, I was just looking at the numbers. In 2019, about 66% of high school graduates immediately went on to some form of higher ed. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is down in 2021 to 62%. So it's declined. COVID, I'm sure, is part of that. Uh, you know, various factors go into that. But it's still, and if you go back to 1970, it was something like, you know, it was like, I think, under 50% mm-hmm. of people immediately went on to college. So we're in, you know, a peak period. But, you know, have you talked to high school people uh, or, you know, are they changing the curriculum or the way that they talk about what do you do when you graduate from here? The conversation's definitely changed. Uh, but again, in pockets, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of this is geographical. As for the curriculum, you know, my foundation now has a curriculum yeah. that's in 20 schools. Um, we hope to get in many, many, many more. That's a, that's a tough sell, yeah. you know, for, for all sorts of reasons. Um, so, I don't know on a macro level really where we are with this, but I do know that when we started, I talked to some educators in um, Peoria and, you know. You're making that up. I I swear I'm not because Caterpillar was was an early partner and there they are. This is a classic, like Cat's a great case study for a company that, is constantly trying to recruit for great jobs that people don't right. think are great jobs. Yeah. And part of the reason, Nick, is because guidance counselors in their very hometown there in Illinois, the proposition to a kid is, okay, four year over here, you know, we've got opportunities over here. And if you don't do this and if you don't do that, you know what you're going to wind up doing? You're going to wind up turning a wrench over at the cat dealer down right. the road. You don't want to do that, right? Yeah. Well, guess what? The cat dealer down the road turning the wrench is killing it. Yeah. He basically set his own hours at this mm-hmm. point. Some are unions, some are not. It depends. But but that's what I mean. Yeah. It's like the, the perception 
really is very granular and it's very mm -hmm. it, it's show me a guidance counselor who's doing it right and i'll show you one who's getting it wrong yeah. i don't i don't know what the research really says honestly mm -hmm. in a in a broad way but i can feel it tipping and i also don't know how to react when you say that fewer people are going to college now yeah. right because my gut wants to high five you my gut wants right. to say great 1.7 trillion dollars in student yeah. loans a huge number of those people you referenced who go to college don't finish, mm -hmm. like maybe half, you know, are they bundled into that number? Right. You know, the first time we talked, you asked me a great question and it, you asked me to explain the fact that so many kids who graduated from college, by and large, were making a better living than those who, mm -hmm. who, who didn't go to college and who just had high school. And uh, whatever answer I gave you, I thought about it later and I was like, no, crap. The better answer is most of those charts, in fact, I've never seen one that has as part of the rubric a cohort of people who finished high school but went on to master a skill that was in mm -hmm. demand. By any, right. it could be an apprenticeship program, yeah. could be a trade school, whatever it was. That cohort is never represented. Mm -hmm. And what I've realized since our earlier conversations, and now that the foundation's 15 years old, is that's where we live. Mm -hmm. We're looking for people. Who, education's not the enemy. The four-year school is not the enemy. We both benefited, I think, from a liberal arts yeah, degree. Tremendously, yeah. I got mine in 84. I'm guessing mm -hmm. you were there in 85. 85, yeah. I, and I worked for a while, and then I went to grad school and got a master's and a PhD. Look at and you go. Look at that. Yeah, Total now, cost of your education, if you had to back uh, the envelope? Oh, uh, God, you know, uh, let's see, probably, I mean, in contemporary dollars, it would be. No, back then. Oh. Uh, you know, I, it's hard to say because I got financial aid and I worked and I took out a few amount of loans, but I came out of a PhD with my PhD, including, uh, undergrad, uh, maybe $10,000 in debt total. In debt. You know? My entire thing, uh, two years of community college, year off, back to school, mm -hmm. got a, a BS in communications and some other minors and whatever. I think the whole thing, the whole thing was twelve thousand nine hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Today, same school, same yeah. course load, ninety two grand. Hmm. Right. So, yeah. I mean, good God, it's uh, yeah. so. So when you tell me fewer people are going to college, I, I'm I'm glad, but I'm not glad because I'm anti college, and I'm not glad right. because I'm anti education. I'm you glad. just hate those kids. I just hate those specific children. Yeah. No, but it it is a kind of interesting question, right? To ask, I think like, so. Are those the people who aren't going to college? Are they doing something else, or are they just hitting the next level? You know, in in Minecraft or World of Warcraft or something like that. Right. And look, it's I don't think it's fair or or nice even to compare a liberal arts degree to. Uh, a skilled trade. I just think the proposition's different. Yeah. But it but it is fair to say that I can I can get the exact equivalent of a liberal arts degree if I'm curious mm -hmm. and I have an internet connection yeah. and a smartphone. Right? 99% right. of the known information in the world is now in my pocket. Yeah. And I can access it whenever I want. Yeah. That wasn't the case in 1984 yeah. for me. So the access to the information is different. Right. Oh. If I may, I would also say for me, and I suspect this is true, a lot of people, um, you know, in, in a similar boat, going to college, among other things, gave me an appreciation for the wider world. Oh, yeah. If I hadn't gone to college, you know, I don't know, like I, I might have ended up working near my hometown or in, in a, a sub trade job because the idea of being a carpenter or a mechanic, you know, and, and everybody can thank me for not going into either of those fields, <laughs> given my, you know, 10 thumbs, uh, you know, but like saying like, oh, well, you know what, you can make something out of your life. And, and by that, I don't mean like, oh, you get to do this or that, but it's like, it's, you can choose your own adventure, yeah. which is really important, I think. And that can be one of the great goals of education. You don't hear much about that anymore when people talk about college now. It's you go there in order to make 90K 
you know, within two years of graduating or this or that or having that credential, um, which I think is a loss. It's understandable because the price goes up. And also when you have second and third and fourth generation kids going to college, mm -hmm. you know, the parents aren't going to sit around. Um, my father didn't graduate high school. He literally had no idea what I did in college. He, <laughs> when my older brother, who was a National Merit Scholar, like he was a really smart guy, my parents were like, well, you're going to college. But they did, they were like, you know, how do you do that? Right. They didn't, they knew people got into college, but they didn't know how. Right. Um, so, but, it, but yeah. that, that's the point of the liberal arts. To me, that was what the transaction was about. You're a curious person, yep. and we're going to satisfy your curiosity. We're going to encourage you to study all kinds of different things right. that you may or may not be interested in. And then when we're done with you, you'll get your paper. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to be qualified to do anything. Right. What you're going to be is a better, well-rounded person, mm -hmm. more so than you were when you went in. Yeah. And then you're going to get yourself hired somewhere. And then you're going to learn a practical skill, yeah. right? That's how it always tracked yeah. for me. Now, though, it, the, God, the pressure for a kid to declare a major, the mm -hmm. pressure to declare and announce the road yeah. you're going to go down. Yeah. And, and it's, it's very hard to get off of that road. And so mm -hmm. if you choose poorly at 17 or 18... Oh, you're locked into a nightmare. You're not yeah. just locked. It's not just a nightmare. It's a, it's, a, it's a very pricey fever dream. Yeah. Right? And you can't... Now you're protecting your investment. Now you've got, now you're holding the paper. Maybe you owe your dad. Maybe you yeah. owe Freddie or Fannie Mae. Whatever it is, it's so, so hard yeah. for kids to go the other way now. After we spoke in 2016, there was a presidential debate. Big one. Mm -hmm. You'll remember all 17 oh, of those yeah, yeah, luminaries yeah. up there, right? It was like a mini series. I think it's still going on. It's, God, God help us. Marco said something in response. I forget what the question was, but he said, what this country needs are more welders and fewer philosophers. Yeah. Big applause line. And later that evening on my little social channels, I mean, thousands of people were saying, hey, Mike, this guy's singing your song. Yeah. This, th this guy gets it. And I thought, oh, crap, I'm, I'm doing something wrong because that's not at all what I mean. Hmm. All right. That's the binary thought. Right. You know, what I responded to uh, in the wake of that was, look, what our country needs are more welders who can talk intelligently about Descartes right. and Nietzsche. Yeah. And what our country needs are more philosophers who can run an even bead. Yeah. Right? It's not this or that. That's that blue yeah. collar, white collar trap right. thing. Like you if you're not this, you must be that. Mm -hmm. That's not no, that's, that's not what that's we're that's a about. great point. And I mean, if anything, one would hope that the twenty first century whenever it gets started, is going to be different. It's not going to be binary like the 20th century was. Labor versus management. Crazy. You know, these are idiotic oppositions that serve nobody. But, you know, Democrat versus Republican, liberal versus conservative. Like, we are digging into binaries that made the 20th century, in many ways, a fantastic, you know, the best century so far, but also a hellhole, right? Because <laughs> well, it's... How do you think the whole work from home phenomenon right now fits in with that. I mean, yeah. that, that feels like a new thing that's yeah. really defining people and separating people. I think it, during COVID, it was a very stark uh, distinction. You know, the kind of what was called the laptop class or the bathrobe class. Um, I found it kind of uh, revolting in the sense of uh, you know, for those of us who could work from home and, you know, I was able on Amazon, I was able to buy a higher resolution uh, web camera. So, and, and I was able to do many more video uh, interviews, mm -hmm. you know, because everybody was around. And I knew a lot of people in my circumstance who were like, let's not rush back to work. You know, we don't, you know, we can wait this out. And this was, right. they had no idea who was delivering the packages that were you know, showing up magically at their door every day. And it yeah. was kind of amazing to see that kind of divide. And I yeah. find that you know, deeply troubling because this goes to your point that like a lot of us are not thinking about, okay, how does the whole system work? We only see the things That's that, right. are, you know, that we want to see. Um, having said that, I've been working from home. I've been telecommuting, as it used to be called, since about 1996. Um, I've had stints in offices 
since and reason has a big office in DC. Um, but um, I am of a mixed mind. I think, again, it's kind of a reversion to the 19th century, you know, where most people before factories, most people worked from home. Mm -hmm. And you have the same nightmare, you know, when you wake up in your workplace, your hearth is, you know, <laughs> you know, you get out of bed and there you are there in the you workplace. Are. It's right like it's, it's a little bit, you know, tough. Um, but I do think what we're seeing is a shift away from strict demarcations between work and non-work and life. And I think they pose, they pose certain types of challenges because you do, it is kind of nice to have an office that's away from your home yeah. so that you're keeping things a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also, it's a melding that is quite good and we need to start coming up with better ways of thinking about this stuff so that we organize it so it doesn't all slop into one another. Have you heard the back and forth between um, Elon Musk and Kevin O'Leary on this? Musk is basically saying this is a moral issue. Yeah. Get to work. It, this is a, it's morally wrong for a giant chunk of the workforce to work from home simply because A, they can, or yeah. B, they want to. That's not the deal, right? Wow. It's a hell yeah. of a thing, right? O'Leary is saying, that's stupid. You have to adapt and adopt yeah. and play the cards we have. And you just gave millions of people a taste of something they want more of. Right. So I have 54 companies that I run. And I, the majority of them are not coming. Yeah. In fact, none of them are coming to work every day. Some are coming half the time yeah. and many aren't coming at all. But they're all getting their work done and so right. forth and so on. But, and this is, you'll love this. O'Leary then says, but when I have a question, I call them. And maybe it's two in the morning. Mm -hmm. Tough shit. Yeah. Maybe they're on vacation. I don't care. Right. If you're going to do this, then if, if you're going to blur the work-life line right. as an employee, then I'm going to blur it as an employer. Yeah. And you are now a doctor on call with a pager right. in 1980. And... I'm running the hospital, right? And that made me think, yeah. oh, well then that at least, now we have a pendulum swinging both ways. Right. And now would the person who would prefer to work from home be comfortable with that new yeah. distinction? Or would they say, no, no, no. I want it to be just like it was when I was at the office, right. but I don't want to be at the office, yeah. right? So I, I think it's a conversation worth having. I agree. And I mean, this is, you know, this is how things evolve and change. And the technologies and the organizations that last are the ones that, you know, kind of figure out how to benefit people more. I know when I, I moved from Los Angeles to a small town in Texas, a prison town, in fact, in Texas. God, you should uh, write brochures. Yeah. Uh, and um, come to what was the name of the town? Huntsville, Texas. Oh, Huntsville. Yeah. yeah. Huntsville, now with prisons. Yeah. Terrific. Yes, that's right. You know, now with. Well, it always had prisons. It was built in order to kind of house prisoners. But in any case, when I moved from L.A. to Texas, I was like, I am never going to work again Like, because I can work from home. Why would I ever do any work? And it turned out to be the exact opposite. And I think this is pretty common where I had a home office um, and I had a fax machine, a plain paper fax machine, which was like unbelievable. I, like. Look at me, you know, the son of peasants owning a plain paper fax machine in like 1996. And every time I could hear the fax machine click on, yeah, I would like, I could be deep asleep. I could be out in the backyard cutting the grass, you know, with no earphones on or anything. And I would immediately be in and making sure that that wasn't the most important fax of my life, of my work life. And so it takes a while to get all of this stuff right. Right. And it, I mean, it takes decades and societies just like individuals have learning curves. But I'm glad to hear that Kevin O'Leary is pushing back on, you know, the idea of, OK, the emergency is over. So now we should return back to, you know, a bullshit 1950s I, IBM AT&T model of work. Right. Um, you know, but it's not all fun and games. Either. Yeah. You know. I, I don't know that it was bullshit, but it was the thing that evolved naturally from that yeah. which preceded it. And to to argue that that's going to be the way it always is forever right. and ever, amen. 
Well, that or that that's the golden age to which we must return. Aspire. I mean, this is the, you know, what I think is so great about the current moment we live in for all of the problems and whatnot is just that the proliferation of choices and options that individuals get to make yeah. about how to live their life, about where to live, about what work to do, uh, you know, even even to work is fantastic. It's a It can be overwhelming. We all have moments. Uh, I'm sure you remember the... Um, Oh, God, it was a Robin Williams movie, Moscow on the Hudson, where he plays a, a saxophone player from the Soviet Union who mm -hmm. escapes and comes to New York and then is like gobsmacked when he's standing in a grocery aisle. And I think it's all of the different types of toothpaste. Can't believe it. Yeah. That's a Boris paralyzed. Yeltsin moment. Yeah, right? he's paralyzed by the amount of choice. And I think sometimes that happens to us as a society. But then the if the if the response to that is like we got to shut down choice and we have to have two or three networks two or three types of jobs two or three genders even <laughs> and that's it like we're doing it wrong well you have to look in that movie the the, the scales fell from his eyes but only when he saw the totality of the choices right and it and it happened too with when Boris Yeltsin walked into that uh, it was a Randall's supermarket wow. in Texas, right? He, you know, he was still very much the Soviet's guy, and yeah. he was finishing his tour here. It was pudding pops. <laughs> he saw the pudding pops, and he wept for his yeah. people because around the pudding pops was all that fresh produce and. Yeah. It was just everywhere, no. and he he later wrote, "That's that's when I knew we're yeah. just dead men walking. We we're not going to win this. We can't, yeah. you know. But it comes from seeing the thing that's underneath the yeah. the pyramid. It right. comes from seeing. He had to see it. A guy at that level, still, yeah. It it wasn't enough to hear about the prosperity. In, and this was Yeltsin. This was Boris Yeltsin. Wow. Yeah." And I, I yeah, guess it was it. that's why he started drinking so much. Well, sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and drinking a rich variety of yeah. uh, juices available at Randall's right. now yeah. on sale. And I, this is a good way to segue into something uh, that I want to talk with you about, which is your whiskey line. Oh, very okay? nice. Okay. And, and one of the reasons why I want to talk about that is because I was looking at the way that you guys promote it and the way that you talk about it and whatnot. And you have a bit on the website about like our story and it was your uh it's it, it's called noble whiskey uh -huh. yeah uh k-n-o-b-e-l and that's your grandfather's name yeah that's my yeah. pop um and could you tell the story of that because what i think is beautiful about it is that it's a tribute to the past but it's also something very modern and kind of forward -looking. yes um carl noble was a magician who lived next door to me where I grew up. He also happened to be my grandfather. And um, when I say magician, I don't, he didn't pull rabbits out of hats, but he got up clean, wandered out into the world, came home dirty. And as a result, something was fixed. Hmm. Something was better. He could take your watch apart and put it back together blindfolded. Same thing with a combine. Hmm. He could build a house without a blueprint. He was that guy. He only went to the seventh grade, but he had this, he had the chip, right? Yeah. And uh, I was pretty sure I was going to follow in his footsteps because I wanted to. I really, really wanted yeah. to. And when you're 13, well, that's your passion. You follow your passion, and mm -hmm. you know. But of course, the handy gene is recessive, as as you certainly know. <laughs> and um, and so I had to get a different toolbox. And it was my pop who said, "Do that. Get a different toolbox. You can be yeah. a tradesman. You can just that's a state of mind." But find something. I don't care. Who cares if you're passionate about it? Just find something you're good at and figure mm -hmm. out how to love it. Right. So that was the best advice I ever got. And that got me in entertainment and way leads on to way. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I knew I was 42 and he was dying. Well, he was 90 and my mother called me. Yeah. I was working for CBS and she said, you know, your, your grandfather is 90 years old. He's not going to be around forever. Wouldn't it be great if before he died, uh, he could turn on the TV and see you doing something that looked like work. <laughs> and the next day, I took a cameraman into the sewers of San Francisco, and that's how Dirty Jobs started. Yeah. Uh, five years later, MicroWork started when our economy went into a recession, and Dirty Jobs was a giant 
hit and I wanted to do something with these good cards I got and try not be a completely rapacious capitalist and give something back. So the TV show Dirty Jobs and the Foundation Microworks were both dedicated to Carl Noble. He only had girls and when he died, he got a weird name and his name died with him. And then a crazy thing happened that I want to talk to you about around essentiality and the notion of essential work. Because when we locked down a couple mm -hmm. years ago, that expression got dragged back into the headlines, right? right? Essential work. Essential work. Non-essential work. Exactly. So, yeah. And man, was this a, an eye-opener for me because Dirty Jobs was the grandfather of essential working right. shows. And the pressure, uh, the enthusiasm really from fans saying, bring the show back. And the network was into it, and I was into it. So I started filming Dirty Jobs again during the lockdown. Mm -hmm. And to sort of commemorate the, the madness of that decision, both because I swore I was done in 2012, and because I'm going out to film at the precise moment when we were at the height of our, the sum of all fears. Yeah. Right? So... I wanted to, to do a show about essential work when we were locked down, not because, not because I thought that these jobs are more essential than, than your job or any other job, but because I realized in that moment that all work is essential. Mm. There is no such thing as a non-essential right. job because everybody's essential to somebody. So I had a little peripatia there in the mm. midst of my uh, quasi-retirement, and I went back to work and I thought, you know, what better way to celebrate all this than put my grandfather's name on some really decent five-year-old Tennessee whiskey uh, that came to my attention. You know, you can't just launch a whiskey brand that's five years old. You have to find the juice. Mm -hmm. And through a weird set of circumstances, I got a line on it. I told myself, if it tastes good, I'm going to go for it. And it tasted good. So I started selling it as a fundraiser for Microworks Online. We've been doing mm -hmm. it for a year and a half. The feedback's been great. And now I'm in the freaking whiskey business, Nick. So one of the things that's fascinating is, I mean, that's a way of telling a story about the past. That is not, it doesn't trap us in the past. Because one of the other things, I mean, I think America as a, as a kind of concept has always struggled with the past. Where we're proud of it or we look at our revolutionary roots, but then we're also ashamed, rightly, of all sorts of terrible things that happened in the past. And the, the question is, how do you pay respect to mm. the past without being trapped? You know, how, do, how are you informed by the past but not trapped in the So past? that, man, that, that really gets, that gets to it. Because when Trump said, let's make America great again, mm -hmm. the opposition really didn't have too much of a choice other than to take the position that it was never great in the first place. Right. And so they did. And suddenly things got reduced into such a horrible binary where, you know, a lot of my friends who were very, very anti-Trump were suddenly making arguments I know they didn't really believe. Right. Because the proposition, the table had suddenly been set to prove that America was not exceptional, right. to prove that this country was never great. Right. Yeah. That That's what he force them to do. They didn't have to do it, right. but, but they took they the bait. They took the bait. They yeah. took the bait. So that's what you're... By the way, to be fair, the same thing is true of Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. When people told me that Black Lives Matter, and when, and, and when they said it with passion, and maybe even shook their finger, I found myself going, well, duh, I know that. You know, why, why are you telling me a thing that I know? And, and, I, and I suddenly found myself saying things like, well, all lives matter, which mm -hmm. of course became heretical right. and deeply insulting. But like, that's how we do it, right? We, we, we grab a bromide, we turn it into mm -hmm. a platitude, and then we got a megaphone and we scream it and we force yeah. people to take positions they normally wouldn't take. I think that's kind of, right, how do, you, how do you venerate, how do you elevate mm -hmm. the past without turning it into a one-dimensional right. mythology? And the hon honestly, the only way I can think of to do that is to make sure you look at what's under the pyramid mm -hmm. and tell both sides. Now, I'm trying to sell some whiskey, so I'm not mm -hmm. going to tell you about my grandfather's shortcomings. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you about his disappointments mm -hmm. because that's just bad marketing. 
But if I were really sitting down with you over a beer and trying to express the, the measure of the man, well, then we would, you would hear the good, the bad, and the ugly. No. You'd, hear the, you'd hear the rest of the story. Right, as right. Pop, right. Yeah. And so, you know, I, when I write stories on my podcast, I, I still try to do that. I, I try and leave you, I try and make you a little uncomfortable by reminding you that Hitler liked to paint and he loved dogs. Mm-hmm. He's a real animal lover, right? So, you know, it's fun to create cognitive dissonance right. in, in, in people's minds. Bad guys don't always twirl their mustaches and wear right. black hats and good guys, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's, I think, what you're asking. You know, how do you, how do you tell the truth? How do you get at the truth of a thing? Right. Without becoming an apologist, right, or becoming where it's just a scorched earth, ter- you know, policy, so that nothing good has happened in the past, or all, all of our idols have feet of clay, and then don't you think today though too that I mean we're like the only way to to be credible today is to speak hard truths to your own tribe. God, I hope so. I mean, I feel like that's kind of in short supply, at least in terms of, you know, political discourse. We haven't been seeing that. And as a result, I think Republicans and Democrats are, you know, they're too uh, preoccupied with, you know, scorching the other side than actually kind of doing the internal work to say like, hey, maybe we we need a new script because right. neither of them is doing particularly well with voters. Right. Owning the libs. Yeah. I mean, it's fascinating to me that somebody like Joe Biden has the same approval rating right now in his presidency that Donald Trump had at this point. <laughs> and that's not good. You know, and it's not good for either of them, but it's definitely not good for America. Right. No, because we government in a lot of ways is like TV. You know, we we get what we deserve. Yeah. You want better TV? Watch better TV. That's right. You want better candidates? Vote for better candidates yeah. and so forth. So, yeah, I, I, I think I, I was just thinking mm-hmm. of Bill Maher when, when mm-hmm. you said that, you know, Bill Maher, he's somewhat famously said, I didn't leave the Democratic Party. Right. The Democratic Party left me. And now suddenly the, my news feed is carpet bombed with him saying things that I find myself agreeing with. Yeah. Which is odd. He's, I mean, he's an interesting character yeah. who has, I think, started to do work where he's less worried about the other side and is kind of like working through his own, you know, uh, complications. And I, I think that's a good thing. I think it, it's certainly a model for media people to be doing. Right. You know, rather than just kind of, you know, constantly trying to throw people off balance by attacking the other side. So what's your plan then? I mean, what's the, what's the role of... Well, I'm going to run. I'm going to announce my presidential run in a couple of weeks. Do it now, man. Do it it to me, because I think this conversation, with your permission, I'm going to share it with my podcast listeners. And And that way you need need the lowest rated show that you can have. Well, it's important that everything else looks good. Yeah, you know, it's like you don't know how high you can soar until you know how low you can go. If, if, if you want to soar with the eagles, yeah. you must wallow with the pigs. That's right, yeah. <laughs> um, well, what I was going to ask you about, because uh, my career at Reason, and I'm actually coming up on 30 in October, I'll have been at Reason for 30 years. Reason was founded in 1968. And in that, uh, you know, in that uh, work span, I've done a lot of different things. I started as an assistant editor. I became editor-in-chief of the print magazine and of the website. I helped launch our video platform. Um, you know, and I, I, like almost every seven or eight years, I would change my job. And that was interesting. And one of the things that Reason has been able to do over the past 30 years or so is to kind of go with the uh, dispersion of old style media. Mm-hmm. You know, we work broadly speaking in an industry where there were, you know, three giants, right? There were, you know, I mean, it sounds like 1984 or something like that. But, you know, there were three continents. Now there are a million different empires, many of which haven't even been mapped yet. And it seems to me your career follows that track too, because you started at places like you mentioned CBS. You worked at QVC, which was really kind of a game changer. Mm-hmm. 
when it came around. You were on the Discovery Channel, which now seems to be an abatement, even as Discovery owns like half of the cable More than you know, half. box, right? Yeah. But cable is also disappearing. And you seem to have found a life, I think you started doing it on Facebook, a kind of direct to audience storytelling and whatnot. And, you know, where do you go from that? Because you are moving into like, you know, wherever the sun is kind of sweeping, you're, you're getting there first. No, and I, I mean, I find that fascinating. Well, you know, it's, thanks. I mean, it, it does feel sometimes when I, when I look back at it that I was ahead of the curve a little bit. But lately, I've really been feeling like I'm, I'm behind it in the sense that cable is contracting. Mm-hmm. Streaming is just, that's a tiger by the tail. Right. Every, everything is changing. Certainly, the news business is changing. Substack, mm-hmm. I think, is going to be a very, very big deal. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the people here at Freedom Fest, Schellenberger, Matt mm-hmm. Taibbi, Right, Barry Weiss. These are the journalists of our time, yeah. and they're reporting on a platform that is just growing with more and more credibility. With and it's fascinating to think of somebody like Matt Taibbi and Barry Weiss, who left. You know, Taibbi left Rolling, Rolling Stone, Stone right. which is you know like wow, that's amazing. Barry left the New York Times because she said, you know, I think you know both famously and also rightly that she didn't want to spend her life trying to reform something. She wanted to build her own, yeah. you know, institution. And it's easier to do that than ever. And it does change, you know, the number of people you reach, the intensity of the relationship. Except, I mean, it, it has a lot of ripple effects. Yeah, it does. Well, what, what happened to me really was I, I lucked out so much in that I was able to keep a foot in both worlds. Mm-hmm. So I did really well in cable, yep. right? Um, and I've, I've been working for Discovery since 1993, mm. like you. Wow. That's 30 yeah. years. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know how many different shows. There was only one, well, two big ones, Dirty Jobs and Deadliest Catch. Yeah. You know, both have been on the air 20 years. Mm-hmm. You know, one is still in production. Um, so like I've been, I was, I, you know, I had pitched deadliest catch a predator, but it never took off. You know what? I'll, I'll talk to yeah. your agent if okay. you want. Cause I think, you know, I think I, I think could sell that there. Yeah. To catch a deadly predator. Oh, that would be very good. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Is, and then is a dirty job to catch yeah. a deadly, <laughs> deadly predator is a dirty job, especially if you're yeah. naked and afraid. That's right. Down under. <laughs> right. That's you did. You a did a season in Australia. I did Dirty yeah, Down yeah. Under. Yeah. Yeah. You you were looking for the facts of life, girl, and growing pains. She's and not every, there. I went yeah. everywhere. Okay. Man. She's yeah. not there. Um, but I'll tell you what is there. Uh, the the same level of curiosity and enthusiasm mm. for this topic, yeah. and it it did remind me that it's it's one of the truly universal things people mm. can talk about. So that's where I got lucky. My pop whose name is now on a bottle of whiskey, gave me some excellent advice. And what it turned into was a chance to ruminate Mm. on work. And that changed, this sounds impossibly grand, but it changed cable. Mm -hmm. There are over 30 shows. I could draw a straight line to dirty jobs, right? So it's it's this big giant topic. And I never wanted to leave cable because I was prospering in being there. But... Yeah, uh, seven and a half million people on a Facebook page, you can't ignore. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm very mindful of that. Did a show for Facebook, did 100 episodes of returning the favor. Um, But I never did what, you know, Dave Rubin is doing. Mm -hmm. I never did what the guy on the, what's his name, Sean Evans, on the Hot Ones, Mm -hmm. you know, where Rick Beato on. on, Yeah, yeah. I really enjoy those programs. And, and And I've really admired their ability to to carve out a platform mm-hmm. with no network oversight at all. Right. It's their advertisers and of course, you know, they're their masters at YouTube. You have to be careful. Yeah. You can blow yourself up still. But in relative terms, it's a it's a much, much more targeted way right. to to reach your audience. You of course are doing the same thing, right? It's a yeah, I mean it's analogous for sure. Do, here's a question. Do you worry about um and and this is something where I think we might be at the right hinge point where I know I don't worry about it that much. Younger people do and older people do. 
where you'll you'll hear people say, well, you know, we don't have anything in common because <laughs> everybody is narrow casting. You know, you watch the things that you like, I watch the things that I like, and everybody else, and like we have maybe one or two things in common. I don't worry about that, partly because I remember what it was like listening to the AM radio, which in honest, you know, in fairness was remarkably diverse. Um, you know, so because, you know, if there were six people in the car and maybe one in the trunk, you, you know, like it had every seven songs had to cycle through every possible audience segment. Yep. But having said that, you know, just feeling totally stultified by turning on ABC, NBC and CBS, um, you know, or, you know, list, you know, just everything was so narrow sure. because it was, you know, so like I don't miss that. But I'm curious, do you miss that kind of, sent, you know, common text that we all, you know, participate in? Well, I think what I hear you saying is that, well, the thing I miss is the shared experience of many, many millions of people. Yeah. Like the next, the day after the Super Bowl, we all have something to right. talk about, and you know, must see TV on Thursday nights. Yeah, yeah. You know, that that kind of a who didn't viewing. miss Wings? You know, come that, on, e Wings, yeah, right? No, God, I forgot about it, but you're right. I, I watched every episode. Yeah, um, but yeah, that that seems to be missing. So we're in our silos a little mm. bit more, right? But I don't know that it's a uh, as long as we have something large. And biggish, and on a selfish level, I'm not too worried about it because I. Uh, this sounds vainglorious, but I have a brand. Hmm. You have a brand. After 30 years of doing this, Nick Gillespie is, in in my mind, a mix of skepticism and reasonableness. Hmm. That's your brand, right? Shit. Sorry, and and a snappy for, dresser. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I was little... going for like aging backwards, but you know. <laughs> Oh, Benjamin yeah. Button on us. Yeah. Um, but 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 that's a broad brand. Right. And it's very much for sale today because we need, in my view, yeah. we need a lot of skepticism. My brand is just more of a good-natured, avuncular curiosity mm -hmm. around what people do for for money and a bit of a philanthropic attempt yeah. to to assist if I can be of use, right? But but those things can apply all over the place. Mm -hmm. So if you're asking on a, on, a, on a business level, on a selfish level, I don't worry at all. Um, if you're asking me as a consumer, then yeah, I, I feel, I guess it's like, what do they call it? FOMA, fear of missing FOMA. out. Yes. I think we're in the golden age of television mm -hmm. right now. This is television. I, right. I stumbled across a show not long ago called The Offer. Okay, the making of The Godfather. Right. It's on yeah. Paramount Plus. Mm -hmm. I had to subscribe and I watched yeah. it. And it was so daggone good, mm -hmm. it made me anxious about what else is out there that I'm missing. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot. I just watched something called The, the Jury, mm -hmm. which is terrific. Yeah, I have watched that myself. Yeah. E every single person's an actor except one dude on right. The Jury. Yeah. And, he, and he turns out to be like Jimmy Stewart. Yeah, like no, he's, he's, yeah. He restores your faith in humanity. Yeah. But but the, the weird uh, the breakout star of that, which sounds ridiculous to say, but is James Marsden, the <laughs> actor, the only guy who's already an yeah, actor. who plays a great parody version of. I hope it's a parody version of himself. I hope it is too. I haven't seen it done that well since uh, Matt LeBlanc. Yes, in episodes. That's right. Yeah, played a version of himself, himself yeah. which seemed pretty real. Yes. So um, my point is. There's a weird level of anxiety when you discover how much good stuff there is. Right. How many good bands have you never heard? Yeah. How many great books have you never right. read? And now, how many wonderful podcasts? Yeah. Who the hell has... There are three million podcasts out there. Yeah. Mine's pretty good. Yours yeah. is terrific. Joe Rogan talks for three and a half hours yeah. at a time. And, and he there's more and, listeners at the end than when he started. I mean, it's... So that's this what the, that's what the seven and a half million working. men are doing. Yeah, exactly. That's what they're yeah. doing. They're just uh, they're on their screen. They're listening to Rogan. They're not working, but Taking by God, supplements and, uh, or, yeah. or or psilocybin. Yeah. <laughs> that's not a bad way to be. You know, it's not bad. Yeah, but so where does that end, though? Uh, or you know, or I guess here's a question for you. Maybe this is a way to kind of this conversation. Uh, like one of your shows, one of your series could mm. go on Never endlessly. Ends. Yeah. Um, but 
What um, we are in a funk as a society, I think yeah. like that. And I think back, uh, you know, I've referenced my parents a bit. I can remember them talking about when, you know, the war ended. My father had fought in World War II. He landed in, in Normandy. He was a Purple Heart recipient, et cetera. But, you know, when, when the war ended, they were like, okay, good. Well, we're not at war anymore, but we're just going to be poor for the rest <laughs> of our lives because, you know, they grew up poor. <laughs> then the Depression hit. And right. then, like, during World War II, everything was rationed. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was like kind of a shitty existence. And they were like, okay, well, we're just going to, you know, that's what it's going to be. Sure. And then by 1950, they were like, you know what, something had changed. And like suddenly almost everybody could become middle class or you could rise from where you were. The world got richer. The 50s is a decade filled with anxiety and hysteria, you know, both about juvenile delinquents and, and homosexuals and, you know, civil rights and communists and all this. But people got on with their lives and kind of were enjoying themselves in a way that they hadn't five years before. I remember, you know, the difference between about 1979 and 1984, something happened, you know, and part of it is, you know, part of it is related to politics and policy. Part of it is just things change. But I feel like we're in a funk and we have been for most of this century, actually, Yeah. you know, because of 9-11. I mean, and actually maybe even because of the the tightness of the uh, Gore Bush election, mm. that kind of like people are like, holy cow, like we are we just making this stuff up, you know, yeah. where everything is down to the flip of a coin. But then 9-11, you know, the financial crisis, the rise of Trump to some degree, COVID certainly. How do we how do we get out of this funk if like a lot of what we've been talking about is like, you know what, there's a lot of really good stuff going on. People have more autonomy, people can choose their adventures. There's more good stuff out there to, to drink and to watch, <laughs> you know, and to drop, you name it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, well, we're, you start we're all sour. You, you, you start with that, hmm. you know, something provocative, like there's never been a better time in the history of to the world buy to whiskey. be alive. The, and yeah. to drink my whiskey then right now. <laughs> uh, why wait? No, look, it's, a, it's an amazing time yeah. to be alive. Um, it, if, if you're going to get sick, you might as well get sick in this country yeah. today. Th this is it. Um, and so forth and so forth. Yeah. You know, you don't want to be Pollyanna about it, but it's important to say that. Yeah. I also think it's important to know, or at least to acknowledge, that I agree with every single thing you've said as you look back through that time period. But I would I'd push back a little and say, I'll find... You're 60 years old now, right? I'm about to be. Yep. Congratulations. I'll bet you... I could find a 60-year-old man in any of those periods you described mm -hmm. who feels exactly the way you feel now. Mm -hmm. Because in relative terms, uh, yep. what you've just done is look back and apply your own experience to a timeline right. that I'm very familiar with. I'm, yeah. I'm in violent agreement with everything you're saying, but a Gen Zer couldn't give a crap. It means nothing yeah. to, to them. They're they're right where we were when we were 18. Sure. When things were pretty screwed up when we were 18, geopolitically, there were there were challenges. Yeah. There were all kinds of things to worry about. For sure. I mean, for me, I think about it. And I, you know, this is why I think the, the story of the whiskey kind of stuck mm. with me. But my parents were like, oh, well, when I was 21, I yeah. went to Normandy and not on vacation. You know, yeah. uh, you know we were poor. We didn't have clothes. We didn't go to college, et cetera. And that, you know, the kind of memory of, uh, of poverty in America, Here's what, which different. was broad based, it, it gave me like, OK, whatever, however bad things might be, you know, right. at least I'm not that. But whatever relative analysis yeah. you're conducting, you're doing it at a time in your life yeah. that is singular. And right. today you're at a different time. You've got more experience. You've got all sorts of other things. To process, but I will say this: I do, I do think we're in a funk, and part of the funk could be the the siloing that we were talking mm -hmm. about. Faith Popcorn was a, oh, wow. yeah, you know her, yeah, the the brand forecaster, yes, yeah, yeah. So the Popcorn Report, yeah, predicted trends, yeah, and uh, she predicted something called uh, cocooning, right. Right, where basically she presaged this time when 
you know, people would start delivering food to us mm -hmm. and we would have less and less reason to leave our homes. Right. Um, and of course, she was awfully right about that. Yeah. Um, and it changed the size of the homes we live in. It changed all, yeah. all sorts of things. But then I remember she came out and she said, cocooning is, is so 1985. Now it's burrowing. Mm -hmm. Now we're not just in our cocoons. Yeah. We're going deep because the remote the access to all of yeah. the great entertainment that we've just programmed our whole entire lives. So part of why we're in a funk is probably because we're just inside too much looking mm. at screens. It, right. it just could be that simple. We've cocooned ourselves. Yeah. You know. I was going to say that about the uh, the screen stuff. You know, one of the things that's interesting is that there's a move uh, that I've been following, which I find really fascinating in the arts, in particular, like in painting and sculpture. Mm to really kind of do things that bring the audience out more because you can access everything via screens and it's great, it's liberating, it opens up the world, but you know, more and more people want to be in a room where something is happening around them yeah, and with other people. Well, why are we like here? That. I mean, yeah. what, Freedom Fest. Yeah. I mean, you know, 5,000 people who have something in common want, right. want to be together. You can't have a yeah. festival alone, right? I mean, you can, but it's yeah. kind of it's kind but of. But that tragic. immersive, uh, you know, crowd-based uh, creation of meaning, uh, mm -hmm. you know, where it's the art isn't happening on the wall or on the screen; it's happening among the people connecting. Yeah, I find that fascinating. I yeah. do too, and and I know how enriched and nourished I feel after an experience yeah. like that. But you're talking about a funk, yeah, you know, and I I think. I remembered now what I wanted to say. It's the it's it's not a new idea, but it's the it's the collapse of our institutions, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 it's the trust. Yeah, like we we need to be skeptical. That's why I'm a fan yeah. of of your brand. But to encourage skepticism today is to encourage a form of uh, uh, denying. And yeah. there are a lot of people like I. This whole Kennedy thing, you know, I'd like I'd love to get Robert your take on him. Kennedy, Robert Jr. F. Kennedy uh, Jr. Yeah. Right has has uh, has got a lot of people all twisted up, mm -hmm. right, in a lot of different ways. And I heard a guy I respect, um, Sam Harris, mm -hmm. making sense. Right, he's got a podcast, and he listened to Kennedy on on Rogan, and basically said that he wouldn't have him on his podcast, at least mm -hmm. not at this point, because he didn't want to platform ideas that he believed were fundamentally irresponsible. Right. And I was so struck by that because I think I think what Sam might be missing in this is this default that we've always had back in the simpler time that you mm -hmm. described, when the initials behind a person's name really were important. You know, a, a scientist mm -hmm. with bona fides mattered. Expertness yeah. mattered, and so the the trust that we we had in our medical community mm -hmm. and in our political class, yeah. you know, I mean that that was never super high, but it's never been lower than right. it is now. Absolutely. So it's just that's it's been a straight line decline. You know, Gallup and Pew and a couple other places have been tracking trust and confidence in American institutions, particularly government. You know, for more than fifty years, and it's just uh, almost a straight line decline. So, There's like, uh, yeah, you know. that's that's honestly Nick, what yeah. I think. What and that is, if I may, that I think it's totally legitimate, because when you look at, you know, if you take the federal government, you know, Washington D.C. since 1968 or 1972 or whenever, you know, they have done everything possible to abuse our trust and confidence in them. It's and, like they double dog yeah. dare you. It's yeah. like and they're like, okay, well, we got away with that, you know. Now what? I mean, the 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 office of the president had more trust and confidence in it when Nixon resigned <laughs> than it has now, and probably for good reason, right? But we can't rest there, right? Because if you go, I write a lot about this. If you go from a high trust society to a low trust society, things fall apart in ways that are horrific, including. We vote in more government because everybody's afraid the barbarians are at the gate. Yes. So we need something to protect us, which then speeds up things. And businesses have acted poorly. You know, religions, the Catholic Church has not fully come to terms with 
a massive scandal, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, of course, that, that erodes social trust and confidence. You trust people less and less. You go out less and less. You know, it's a thousand need, cuts. Yeah, it's and we need to, cuts. you know, kind of have a renaissance, <laughs> not of stupidity of just like oh, okay, blind trust, but how do we build up new institutions and how do we salvage the ones that are going to persist? I think I know part of the answer, but I love this metaphor though yeah. of a death by a thousand cuts, you know, versus a thousand points of light. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's those two things fit hand and glove, but geez, I think, I think five years ago, who was the doctor that Kennedy talked about that Rogan invited to come back and debate? Uh, uh, Peter Hotez. Hotez. Yeah. Okay. Five years ago, had Peter Hotez said, look, I'm an expert. I'm a doctor. Right. I've litigated this. I've looked at this. I'm not going to dignify it. I think a lot of people probably would have nodded mm -hmm. and said, oh, okay. Today, I feel like that guy didn't get the memo, Yeah. right? We just lived through an incredible time when a lot of very certain sounding people mm -hmm. made a lot of very dogmatic proclamations that yeah. turned out to be dead wrong. Without reservation, and this week, don't wear a mask. Next week, wear a mask. The following week, eh, maybe wear a mask, right? It's like me. I'm yeah. a narrator. I'm paid to sound certain. So when I yep. narrate how the universe works and tell you that there are 200 billion known galaxies in the universe, I sound like I sound now. Yeah, right, and two weeks later, when they call me back in to reread it, because as it turns out, there are two trillion, yeah. right? Not a typo, but new tech, mm -hmm. new numbers, right? I sound the same. Right. I sound exactly the same as when I'm off by two trillion as I do when I'm right. Mm -hmm. So does the president. So does Hotez. Yeah. So does Joe Rogan. Yeah. So does Robert Kennedy Jr. Mm -hmm. So this whole love affair with certainty and this whole thing that, that, that Sam Harris was saying, it's like you guys have to understand that there is no goodwill left. Right. Reasonable people who embrace a level of skepticism that I personally espouse have every right to look at your credentials and go, persuade me. Right. So I want Hotez or somebody to yeah. step up. And that's my answer to your question. We're in a funk because the rug has been pulled out from under the expert class. Yeah. And the experts are not making a fundamentally persuasive case for the rest of us. Right. Instead, they and their apologists are saying, we're not going to dignify that with the mm. debate. Well, I'm sorry. I don't think that plays in Peoria anymore. Not today. Now, that, that sounded certain, didn't that's it? That's a very good uh, note to end on, I think. That's and not I, bad, I, I think you're absolutely correct in that it isn't, you know, there are ways to rebuild trust and confidence. We do this individually in our lives all the time. Yes. We can do it societally. We can do it in our institutions. It's, you know, and, and the beginning of that turnaround, I think, in, comes in acknowledging the limits of our knowledge mm. and when we're wrong, and then how do we go about doing a better job? And look, you play a role in this, Nick. Mm. I mean, I, I, I really- I know in driving down trust and confidence in <laughs> almost everything. No, look, I mean, when you talk about Substack and you yeah. talk about you know the guys we mentioned and the women, reason is an organ. You know, re it's, it's, it's an opportunity because mm. people are going to look I think, uh, for, for something that, that feels, I don't know if it's honest or authentic, but the tribes need to hear the truth from their own right. tribesmen. And that's what I meant before. He, here we are, here I am encouraging a more skeptical worldview at a time when experts are telling me, don't be skeptical, mm -hmm. just still take our word for it. Yeah. That is a recipe for, for oh, some absolutely. kind of collision. Yeah, yeah. And I, th you know, this is also this is a whole other galaxy to talk about. <laughs> but, you know, we're living in an age of forced transparency yeah. where the truth is going to come out, whether you like it or not. You might as well get ahead of it and just kind of admit what you know and what you don't know, what you're not certainly sure about, et cetera. 
and get on with figuring out how to how to live a better, more interesting life. I just want to tell you about Steve Forbes. Yes, please. Who's outside? Okay. So, like ten years ago. By the way, ago, don't give him any cash. He just spends it on booze. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what else yeah. he did. He says he wants to buy a hot dog, but he doesn't. Ten years ago, I really showed my slip and wrote some invective about the madness of ranking the top universities mm -hmm. year after year after year, again and again and again. It's like, what a, what a ridiculous mm -hmm. bit of kabuki this is. But if we're going to do it, how come nobody ever rates the best trade schools? Yeah. Well, Forbes magazine printed a lot of what I spewed up and said, Mike Rowe has a point. And ever since, they've been ranking yeah. the top 30 trade schools. And that's a hopeful note to yeah. end on because that's, it, in my world, that's part of what, what has to happen. Although he always still puts Princeton at the top because that's where he went. You know what? I, some of yeah. my favorite welders came out of Princeton. <laughs> Talented women. Thank you so much, Mike. Really fun. Appreciate it.